At first, I would like to say thank you to the organizers, and in particular to Jorge Arevalo, for having invited me to be here and share with you my passion. I agree with Churchill when he spoke about dealing with success with enthusiasm. After having spent my whole life here, I started 30 years ago when this looked like science fiction. Here I am. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I would also like to say that artificial intelligence, it is already here, even if today it is a buzzword. In last October or November, the European Union did its, its strategic plan. And up until the year 2030, year after year, we're going to be having 20 million euros allocated to different AI activities and in particular to something which is very important, ethical and philosophical questions concerning everything that is ahead from us. The difference between science and science fiction, sometimes that difference is very light. So let me clarify what AI is, computational intelligence, where are we and where are we heading to? And I'm going to be talking about data, but uh, let's not be afraid of that. We are not going to be commanded by machines. That is what I wanted to say from the beginning. So first of all, let me start with my presentation. And there will be two parts in the presentation. First, I will be speaking about the factory of the future. A few months ago in Pamplona, we celebrated the first day of industry. And Volkswagen came with us and showed two videos showing car manufacturing in 15 years time. And here we can see some people who are there, but in Volkswagen factories, there are no people. They only have cobots and robots. So this is what is coming. It is already here. Industry 4.0 is going to eliminate repetitive tasks. And in the second part of the image, I speak about da data. We can have big machines, collaborative robots, cobots, which are going to be communicating with each other just as we have natural language and we need information so as to speak and talk. So machines and we too were going to be talking according to how many data or information we have digitized. But I need to be able to read that. So the big move forward since 2013 is that we can read and learn out of all that information. The problem, I insist, is going to be coming from data, from information more than linked to a I. There are many definitions, and I always start by the very first one, which is the best. I enjoy going back to the classics. This is a very old concept. It is a very old concept, but classicals are those who defined this in 1955 and published about it in 1956. Ah, vale, vale. Esto sí. Bueno, tengo que decir. I have to tell you that here we, you can see John McCarthy, one of the pioneers one of the pioneers in the US, and up to that period in the world of science, we are worth just as much as we publish. And where do we publish? If I want to be given a European or any other project, I, they are going to take a look at what I have done, my publications in those magazines. So these people were not publishing in those prestigious magazines. So they decided to come together and set the pillars of AI. What is artificial intelligence? So this is a science, a science, which implies building machines. So we are speaking about engineering in such a way that these machines are going to do things that if humans did them, we would require intelligence. We would say that that person is intelligent. This is the idea underpinning AI. The concept is this one. I'm going to be using a further term, which is simulation. We're going to be simulating people's intelligence. But how are we going to do it. So from 
the symbolic point of view, we're going to be using algorithms, a box where I will be introducing some input information and I will obtain results. Those results are going to be given by the best experts ever and which coincide with what I would be obtaining from intelligent people. Second paradigm. The second paradigm is the following. If human brain is a machine, such a perfect machine, let's imitate it and let's use other ideas, neuronal networks and deep learning. This is the connection paradigm. The father of these two paradigms is Alan Turing. Alan Turing, so let's accept this definition. There are many other definitions. In the video, there were many other definitions. As soon as there is a definition, there are two articles criticizing the definition. The last one, which I think quite coherent, says that this is the science which is going to try and help us make good decisions. As Jorge said, the biggest problem we have today is how to make the right decision. If that is a problem for us, then let's imagine how can we have a mathematical model simulating those decisions? Because I want my machine just to react as myself whenever I make up my mind. So once again, many definitions. But the real one comes from these two people, Alan Turing. Well, one of them was in Pamplona some years ago. And then let me ask a further question. For example, can a machine be intelligent? Well, let's go back to the concepts. Can a machine fly? We all know that machines fly. We all use aircrafts, airplanes. They can fly according to certain physical laws which are respected, which takes place in nature, but they do not fly just by imitating a bird and how it moves its wings. So machines can be intelligent, but with a machine-type intelligence, which has nothing to do with our human intelligence even if we include the computational brain. So let's imagine, imagine that a machine can be intelligent with that machine intelligence, and that is going to be simulating our human intelligence. Having said that, let me say two more things. There are two types of intelligence. Artificial intelligence, weak AI, weak artificial intelligence. So, AI is divided into two types, just like in physics, the origin is always mathematics and physics, and then, of course, programming comes later. So we have weak AI is that we are speaking about it all day long. We use it all the time. You know, our washing machines, they are going to be using soap in one way or the other. The case of cars or lights coming on off intelligent brakes and then something which is our telephone and our telephone for example has uh, Siri and that implies that we can talk to the machine directly so today what do we want to do with our mobile phones? Big companies, big telephone companies, in two years' time, they want all of us to switch our telephone on and off just by using our mind, just like that. And that means that then we will have to go to the other type of AI. But now let me open up parentheses and let me tell you about computational soft computing in Europe. This is what people are talking about when we speak about AI. So here, it is important to know how decisions are being made by people, but something essential too is nature in this concept. And there are three pillars which are essential too. The first pillar is approximate reasoning. We were saying before, Jorge was speaking about it. He was speaking about white and black, good and not good. Results of the elections in one way or another. Better was our football team, Real Sociedad, is in the first division. This is our natural language. I'm not going to arrive here and say, in a 20, if we have 200 grades of uh, gray, 
no, no, I say I'm going to be painting my house in dark gray, and now let's go to machines. I'm going to go and say to my machine, today I'm not feeling well. I didn't enjoy this coffee, and I already have three problems to solve. That is the dialogue I'm going to be having with the machine. And I'm going to be using the few sets which were born in 1965. And this was essential in the world of logic concepts, depend upon the context, and I can use an approximate reasoning. Coffee is very good. That is how we talk. I'm not going to say, here the temperature is 23 degrees, I will say. It feels good in here, temperature is correct. Then let's talk about neuronal pillars. How do machines learn? Well, I will be telling you more about it later, but uh, something essential in this perspective took place in 2011, but the mathematical developments were born in 1977 or 1982. Mathematics were moving very fast, and they were much more advanced than technology. But what has happened since the big data in 2003? We have very powerful machines. We have developed all those mathematical approaches, and we are moving forward. If we only focus on machines and technology, and if we forget science in 50 years' time, things will stop. But Google, for example, are investing a lot in science. And the third concept is to look at nature. Nature should be our inspirations and take a look at nature so as to obtain good results. And that is why we have those optimization algorithms. And I always give the same example. Dorigo, an Italian person, started speaking about ants. Ants come out every day at the same time. And they are going to be creating pheromones, and they always follow the same pathway. The first ant that finds food takes the food and goes back, so then there are going to be twice as pheromones there. Once the ant, ant has come out, the others are going to be following, and those pheromones are going to be deposited here. And that is going to be the cycle. There will be more and more pheromones being left or excreted by these ants. So mathematical unsolved problems are important to take into account too. I can have a very well developed project and say this Santander bank, there are these or those debts and I have tried this with algorithms. No, we cannot solve that problem. So we still have many problems associated with these three pillars. These three elements represent computational intelligence as part of global intelligence. Global artificial intelligence has problems such as, for example, the decision-making process. Let me go now to the strong AI. I'm going to be trying to imitate feelings, sensations. I am going to simulate that. In the US and in Europe, the brain has been mapped and by using big algorithms, by experts, areas of the brain have been isolated and we know how one part or another in the brain is activated. And I thought that they were lagging behind, but there have been huge breakthroughs and I will be showing you how in my team in Navarra, we what we have been able to do. So we have weak AI and strong AI. So very quickly, let's continue. Some backgrounds. In 1956, the concept is born, which is the very first idea. I'm going to make machines that can do everything in the morning. They will make coffee. They will drive me to my office, switch the computer on. The machines in Odyssey 2001, a film that was shot in 1961. One year later, we went to the moon. Computers had 32 and it was programmed by a lady. So the most decisive contributions have been made by six women when we speak about AI. And we should acknowledge that the importance of those six women, but 
in the 1968 or 69, we said, let's make machines like those in this film. But of course, Japan got afraid, very scared, the US too, and they said, we cannot invest that much money into something which is not going to pay. And scientists started just using a I to solve, for example, an infectious disease, something specific. I'm going to study this so that somebody in front of a computer can identify the symptoms, etc. but just exclusively for that disease. Then we reached the 1980s, which was blind from the technological point of view, but from the scientific point of view, there were great breakthroughs, for example, neuronal developments. So from the theoretic point of view, big things were done. 1998, and for the very first time, we start winning at playing chess. And we could speak a lot about it, but if chess is a game being played by intelligent people, well, if we have a machine winning a person, that machine will be intelligent. Algorithms. In 1968, any computing students of mathematics students knew about that algorithm. Then internet arrives, and there are two key decisive moments. The year 2003. In 2003, the concept of big data is published. This is a very old concept, but it is going to be taken into account problems taking place in the years 1998, 2000, 2001, and those problems are solved great, but also the human genome is found out without using big data, but with big data they can show that a genome sequence is going to define cancer, but that cancer may have been produced by other sequences, that was the big flop, but by using big data, they were able to prove that. And then the Columbia disaster, which changed our lives. In the year 2003, NASA launched this rocket, and as you know, as a result of the temperature problems, the rocket collapsed and three people died. So the idea was to follow second after second all the different pieces that exist in any machine, not only in a rocket, but cars, for example, too. An anecdote, when they decided to build, to make their first intelligent screw in the European Union, somebody from the Basque country was there, he heard about it, he came here, and the first prototype was made here. So the thing is that all the parts of a car are going to be giving me information about their evolution second after second by using big data. At any moment, I can know what is happening. And maybe I will know. In 300 kilometers time, you are going to have a problem with the valve, for example. So that was the origin. So we move forward and we read 2012-13. We have so many data, so much information, and we start talking about data science or information science applied to many different fields. So this is uh, already an important degree, highly demanded in the US and in Europe. Its characteristics, 50% of the subjects are mathematics. The idea is to make optimum or to do optimum things. So with deep learning in this period, in 2012-13, we reached this situation, data information, 2007 now. And I like this slide very much because in 2007, out of the top 10 companies, nine of them were making cars or working with energy. Only one was working with uh, information. As you know, things have changed very much today. What are we going to do when we talk about data? I am not talking about apps or applications. I'm not saying that I am going to type Umberto Bustince. That information they already have it, but they know 
who am I talking to? Which are my hobbies? What do I do in my leisure time? This is what is being used today in data science, and that is a scary. I am not scared by robots. It is a scary to know what people are doing with this data, with this information. And anybody can use that, you know, and there are people who can use uh, that information. We need to insist and say to young people, anything we type in in a computer or on the internet is going to remain and leave a trace there. So I'm going to be collecting all this data and I am going to do predictions. I need mathematics, but not complex things. We're not going to be doing difficult things. And then two concepts, big data and data mining. And it is true that we tend to be confused. What is data mining? Let's imagine that we collect all the data coming from the Basque country in the last 40 years in terms of taxes. We have many people and we have loads of information about each of those people. Am I going to be using data mining or big data? Well, it depends. If uh, I can say, Umberto Bustince has to pay 3,000 euros and I can do that on real time or in two days' time, then I will go to data mining. I will be getting that first information and once I get to the back of the list, I there I go again in a cycle. When I can have cycles, I am using data mining. In any data mining system, there are going to be three key elements, key in terms of our training in any different field, which is data processing. That is the most difficult thing that exists. If we go to a hospital with all the hospital or clinical records, we have loads of information, but we need to put those data into order. If not, they will be useless. And that is the most costly thing. Any three-year project always takes one year and a half just to put all data into order. But if I want to improve production, because AI is going to improve production systems. So what am I going to do? I will be taking all the images in the production process. For example, if we are making airplanes or wings for Boeing, for example, and we are going to detect which are the problems, what are we doing well or wrong. But first, we need to collect all the data coming from the last 10 years, and we need to analyze them. And that is a huge business opportunity. And also, it is very cheap. So it can be done in Algeria, for example. We do not need to have experts doing that. But it is highly important. And now we use algorithms, and I learn. This is something we're doing well. We need to improve this. That is data mining. And we were in this situation, and the situation was the following. I have a machine, and the machine has a program. For example, taxes in the Basque Country. I have all these data, and I obtain our results. Yes, this person has to pay this or that. What happened? We had more and more data, more and more information. And even if the machine was very good sometimes, it couldn't cope with all that. So what came next? Distributed computation. I take a 1,000 computers. In each computer, I always going to have the right software. And out of each computer, I extract knowledge. And then I need to merge this with aggregation functions. And this is the great contribution from mathematics. In my group, we are experts at that. Why? Because often we need labs, but this is just theory. And here, we are doing things well. We merge everything we have, we fuse it, and then, just like the brain, we try and make a decision. First problem in terms of AI, the brain works in a specific way. We, each of us, make our own decisions. Maybe I want my house to be located in a certain area, and maybe that is not important for somebody else. So decision making is the very first problem when we speak about AI, and we need to solve it. And the models we have today are very poor at that. But OK, we extract knowledge. So that was the situation we had at that point. But usually, I am not going to be having 
loads of information and data. I cannot waste time and go through all those data. No, I'm going to have many, many data, all different, and then those data will be represented in different ways, and I will have to give a real-time solution. If I am managing traffic in New York City, that is where big data, where big data started being used, I need real-time results. I cannot wait for three hours. It has to be real time. And that gave rise to big data. I am not going to be working with cycles. I'm going to be using all those data in the Basque Country, and I will be going from the first to the last one. But uh, just uh, at once, I'm going to be solving all the problems, and very, very quickly, in less than a second. So that is big data. And it and at that point, we have the right machines, because this is just, you know, particle theory from the 19th century. The problem is that uh, we had, um, we needed to have, uh, to improve our machines. Okay, so that is big data. And then we reach this situation. Google decides to class, to classify users in 11 types, usually, yes, between 8 and 11 types, and they say a young adolescent who enjoys playing sports, this, that, and I'm going to be bombing them with whatever information I want. That is what Google wanted to do. And in 1998, they decided to use all this information on the best computer, and it took them 46 days. And they said, no problem. Instead of having one computer, I will be using a 1,000 computers. All of them will have this uh, specific program of software. And then this uh, was it was able to do it in 60 minutes, more or less. But they still had more and more data. So what were they doing badly? what was wrong. So distributed computing, that is what I need. But in each machine, I am not going to have the software. I will only have data. I'm going to be taking all the computers in Gipuzkoa, connected to the internet, and those computers will only contain information, data. Each uh, computer will contain that information, but there will never be a software. They will all be connected, and what I am going to be launching is not information or data, but the software, the program, and that there came the revolution. Data were not going or being fed into the computer, and this is something basic when we speak of big data. Well, that was great for Google. Thousands of applications are born. Of course, we said this cannot continue. So the first open code had to is born a few years later. And the philosophy is the same. We take the information, we divide it into blocks, we copy information into several blocks, and then each data has a certain value, and then I am going to be merging or fusing according to the values we have. We have been publishing a lot in big data, and we have good apps in our group. And then this goes again and again. We could be talking for hours about it. Today, we are not using MapReduce, but Spark. Spark is a new method to tackle these problems. And now I can work with cycles. But big data, a big volume of data, no cycles. And the program, the software, goes to the computer that according to big data, apps, applications, anything you want. We could be talking about waste collection, urban transport. For example, a bank has a system, uh, you know, which, for example, says gay pride um, parade. Uh, you can use this ATM, whatever. So emergency services. Sensors are very cheap, so they are all over the place. And that is how many data can be collected, and we can predict electric consumptions, traffic lights, evolution of deserts, predictions in terms of climate change, 
Well, so this is the very beginning when talking about big data. And now, very, very quickly, let me talk to other topics. Do machines learn? Yes, they do. What is learning? And I, it looks like magic, but it is not. It is not magic. What is learning? And then we will see how machines learn. Learning is what you can see here, the creation of programs, algorithms that can generalize behavior by using examples. A project that we have developed consists on predicting strokes. We went and collected the data information of the last three years in Navarre, and one patient after the other, we said, OK, this was happening, this, 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 and that. These were the symptoms before the stroke 2015, 2016, and that is what we've done with all the patients. Today, learning, what will it do? What will it do? We take a patient, we compare the symptoms this patient has compared to those others, and we are able to predict. This method implies learning by examples, but it is just a mathematical induction system. It is only that, just that. That stroke, once again, has, there are six different types of stroke. We are always going to be classifying people. For example, 40% of patients coming to us do not have a stroke, but between type one, three, or four, you know, that classification, type one will be able to recover, type three will have problems, will have a relapse. So that classification is essential. So that is how machines learn. This is the system, strokes, polymedication. If these things happen, this patient can be considered type one, for example, or type three. And another method which has been a revolution, and it is impressive, is deep learning. Deep learning, it implies that test and mistake. I have five specific cases. For example, this person is suffering from this or from that. I am going to model all this, and I am going to be learning certain parameters. So I start with the first one. And I say, yes, for this person, I have this and that. I go to the second. No, the second element is not there. I change it. But I need to optimize it, taking into account what happened to the first one. And that is how I am going to be learning. That is how a neuron learns. In neurons, we have dendrites. Some of them are going to be activating, and others will be inhibiting. When we add them all up, if this is positive, neurons will be activated and will be acting. But neurons are just going to be able to say yes or no. That's all. So the imitation of neurons is the perceptron in computing, x1, x2, x3. This is what we have here. And now I have to learn about the weight. I establish the average, and I will know if this is going to be activated or not. I insist. The idea is to know about the weight. In our brain, we have many neurons connected, and in deep learning, the same. We have many neurons which are connected in different layers imitating the brain. In each of these neurons, what we are going to be learning about are the weight, weights. And then magic appears, magic comes. And this is something we cannot stop. Any production system need to, needs to use deep learning. And there are three problems, but let me give you some examples. Problems. I am going to classify no data or images in my telephone, but all the dishes or plates in Europe, what is their color? Are they in China? Are they in glass? I do all this classification. And I am going to be learning. I am going to be taking all those uh, plates, dishes, and I learn. Now I go to a different dish, and, and I say, well, these are the characteristics of this dish, this plate. 
but uh, those ones were 20 centimeters, and this one is one centimeter bigger. That is the problem when in the US, when they take 50 million white people and they want to learn from them, as soon as there is a, a black person, for example, joining in, he says, he is a gorilla. So depending on how we learn, we will obtain one problem or another. I take all the racist books in the world, and I learn and I establish a racist system. Well, Asabis, for the very first time, was able to succeed at the game of Go. Go is a very complex game. And here comes the second scary part. Asabis was successful. He won $1 million, but he generated an algorithm that was able to learn from the former one. Algorithms learning from other algorithms. What was the problem? The problem is that it was learning, but it was not able to adapt. If I am moving from one board to a different board, human brain can do that, but not computers. But you know, the first seed was planted. Next problem, if I am going to be using all the information coming from El Corte Inglés, and if I classify all the clients through deep learning, if El Corte Inglés is purchasing products from Lafayette, we have a problem. And this is very time consuming. And third, this is just like a black box, so as to say. There is no going to be a justification. It is not justified. So we are speaking about robotics, robots that are going to be replacing, being able to do repetitive work. Cobots, cobots are robots that collaborate in order to implement or to carry out a task. There is a lot of science fiction cobots in Pamplona. Volkswagen has 560 cobots. A cobot is going to be doing one task, two, and three. And then it goes to cobot number two to do task four and five, and then it goes back to number one. But if there is a problem, it is not solved jointly. In the video we watch with the cars, there are cobots there and not people. And I think that in 10 years' time, that won't be done any longer with people. That is something 100% mechanical, and it will be done like that. In Gipuzkoa, there are some people making cobots. For example, I cannot make this part this piece, can I solve it? It will be solved with cobots. What can I tell you? There are so many problems that we are solving. So we have a further problem. We can say that self-driven cars are at level one or 20. The very last level is the most difficult one. That is when I call my car and I say, car, come and pick me up. But uh, you know, any computing un university student is going to be able to use big data and to make that happen. The problem is hackers. Second computing problem, we need to invest a lot of money so as to have safety and security. If I have all my cars in San Sebastian, if they are self-driven. Estabiliza todo el sistema. Si yo le digo a un coche. If I ask my car to come and pick me up, and if a student says uh, it is not going to get there, that self-driving car or autonomous car, it won't, it won't be getting there. Industry 4.0, let me talk about it now. This is a mix between sensors that are very cheap, cameras, robotics, robots that are not as complex as that, and AI that will be making decisions. The, the main idea is that all repetitive work is going to be eliminated. That's the thing, Volkswagen in Navarre, car makers, 40% of the chain workers are not there any longer, and the goal is that in a few years' time they won't be there at all. So all our students, workers, they need to go through upskilling. They need to be able to reply and overcome difficulties. But there won't be repetitive tasks. 
for example, if we speak about uh, dentists in the world of dentistry, we have 3D, 3D printers that are going to be doing great things in terms of prosthetics, for example. So the advantage is that uh, repetitive tasks are going to disappear. So the great advantage, customized, personalized medicine, precision, medicine. So this was a project for prostate cancer where the idea was to separate the tumor, to isolate the tumor. So this is what the expert doctor was doing and this is the program. But then we received in the year 2005 a project to study skin melanoma to know whether you will be developing cancer or not. And this magazine published this article some months ago, deep learning is already there in the US. They are already analyzing all these different uh, problems. They can predict whether the evolution is going to be good or bad, if we will be developing cancer or not. This is helping doctors. This uh, publication is very important for us too. Instagram photos. Young people uploading their pictures in Instagram very well. So now we can predict if a person in six months time is going to be suffering from depression or not. So watch out careful with our photos. Cancer, breast cancer screening. And, uh, you know, Google uh, has a machine, a device that can assist doctors, and they will be able to know if uh, any person is going to be able to develop cancer or not. That already exists. No, so now let me talk about strong AI, and that will be the end. And I am going to, for example, I was in Naples talking about aggregation and somebody who had been working with Obama in the brain mapping and said to me, listen, I have a problem. This is my problem. We want to know when a person is thinking one thing or the opposite, if this person is, is thinking yes or not. But pay attention, careful, careful. I only would like to know if a person is thinking about moving the right or the left hand, just that. That's all I want to know. To do so, we can do just like in this picture. Picture. They were cooperating with Taiwan, the Polytechnic in Sydney, and ourselves. And by using the classical aggregation system, they are successful in 60 percent of the cases. And they came to us and said, let's join our efforts. And we launched a project where all Tuesdays and Thursdays we were meeting together, the three universities, and we started working together. What did we do? The idea was very simple. Let's put 30,000 people. Let's uh, use this uh, helmet, and we said to them, please think about moving your right hand, and I could take a look at the wave, then the, the right, the left hand, with 30,000 people, 20 times each person. So I collected this information, this data, and then I said, okay, think, but I am going to know what are you thinking, but what is the problem? Now I go to anybody, and I say to you, think about moving your right hand or your left hand, and I am going to guess. So we take this person, the helmet, we divide four bands, different characteristics, and we could know if this person was thinking about moving right or left hand. We aggregated the information, and suddenly we were 82% successful. We went from 60 to 82%. That was the rate of success. But this cannot be used for people suffering from Alzheimer. It has to be done with uh, conscious people. So next step, the only thing I am going to do is to take one single only person and I am going to be putting a mechanical arm next to this person and I am going to say feed me but I am just going to be activating or not the robot I have already programmed this robot and I'm going to say give me water or feed me give me food yes or no so here comes the video
This is real. It has been published last February in the most important magazines in the US. So this person is thinking about grabbing the spoon. And this person says to the robot, grab the spoon. Grab it, take it, or leave it. Once he has said, take the spoon, the robot has been programmed so as to start making certain moves. But this person is just going to say, take it or leave it. Take the glass or take the spoon. So this is the reality. This is how this AI is working. It is true that for, we will end up being able to switch on and switch off our telephones just like that. So very quickly, everything that I have been saying about things such as law, journalism, natural language, you know, it has evolved so much. Machines can sum up information. We do not need people summing or doing resumes and, or summaries. Natural language, yes, Google is already using today, well, not today, but a few months ago, they have launched intelligent mails. They learn from how I write, and then I can go and say, I want to write Gantt University, and they are going to be writing the email instead of myself. And this is almost done. I have seen it in London. There is an intelligent text processor. I can write a few lines, and it will be able to write or to draft a whole letter. And the same thing about direct translation. One program, one software in two mobiles. It works only between two people. You know, in terms of translation, huge things are being done. For example, we started working for the bank in Navarra. We had to tackle debt people had, people who were not paid. And there is such a big battle between China and the US already in China. These different apps or programs can arrest people before they make a mistake or a fault. I know that in the US and in China, they are in a different war. Here in Europe, we are trying to do things. We need to study ethics and philosophy if we want to regulate all this in the right way. If not, we won't be successful here in Europe. Money is important and trade too. But we know, we know very well which are the areas in my house where I spend more time. They know how much time I spend in front of my computer or in the kitchen. They already know about that. So we need to have an ethical approach and do things well. Face recognition, you know the systems are already almost perfect in face recognition. Last week, we were told that in San Francisco, they have decided that they do not want this system. We know what is happening in China. Cameras are there. But in the US, they are reluctant and they are afraid. Intelligent cities, what can I tell you? In a few years' time, cities will be managed in an intelligent way. Who will be owning cities? The owners of the cities will be those who have all the information. Will machine be the owners? No, not at all. Certain things will disappear. For example, what would happen if we had to spend a whole day without our telephone? But today, we cannot say that algorithms will be more intelligent that, than science, scientists designing them. No, algorithms will never be more intelligent than, than us. So studies for the future, well, everything I have already told you. I don't know if I have fulfilled your expectations in terms of VET and everything coming. These techniques have to be all over. They have to be included in all our curricula, all this 
students need to know about all these different systems. Our students need to know how to use these tools. There are going to be new works, but let's not be worried. The Industrial Revolution was there, and we knew, we know what happened. So there is just one difference if we compare this one with former revolutions. This is not only going to be an industrial revolution, but a scientific revolution. Scientists are going to be doing all the developments hand in hand with technology, and then all the rest we will need to use. Uh, we need to use to know how to use those technologies. That's all. Thank you very much.